Welcome everyone to another episode of Nurse Radamus. I'm Dr. Pants. I'm Lambo. And it's Valentine's Day. Mm -hmm. And love is blooming in the air. And at the risk of sounding like a couple of filthy casuals. And horrible nerds that are lonely without any girlfriends. We're going to talk about a, a, a weird kind of thing that I guess, you know, only nerds really like to think about. And that's romancing AI. <laughs> Ah, mm -hmm. ah, romance options in video games. Yeah. Getting to know your digital waifu. <laughs> that should be an entire series. <laughs> Getting to know your digital waifu. Yeah. If it's not, <laughs> let's make it happen. Yeah. But anyway, with it being almost Valentine's Day, we figured we'd talk about an aspect of video games and in that regard, like maybe a subset of video games, that kind of focus on something like that. Mm -hmm. Because in recent years, we've seen like a boom in games that allow us to romance mm -hmm. other characters, NPCs. <laughs> and it goes back really, really far. It really does. Um, uh, when I actually looked back to see how far it goes, I mean, the options for romancing NPC characters goes back. I mean, and it's always not surprising. It's always, like, really far back on the PC. Oh, yeah. And then sometime in the 90s for on console, right? Mm -hmm. That's just the way it ends up going. Yeah. Um, but the first time I ever remember seeing it yeah. was in a little game called Harvest Moon. Ah, on the Super Nintendo, a classic. That game gave you um, five options. That's a lot for a, for a game that old. That's yeah. a lot. Yeah, uh, five options for uh, some kind of a uh, young bachelorette on the town for you to. Well, really, it was adorable to romance and then grow old with. Yeah, because mm -hmm. Harvest Moon was a simulator. You got a farm, mm -hmm. you raised crops, you raised animals, all these things, and you just made a life for yourself. Yeah. So, I mean, like, why not have a romance option? Yeah, exactly. And it, it definitely drove home that whole idea that, you know, you're following someone through their life. Right. You know, and the whole maintenance part of the game also then extends over into the, the relationship part of it, right? It and, does. I, and I think that actually does a really good job of being honest about relationships in general. Because relationships need maintenance. They do. Mm -hmm. They do. But lately we've seen games like start to incorporate romance options into all kinds of stuff. Mm -hmm. Particularly with the boom of open world games that we've seen over the past decade or so. Uh huh. We've seen that added to it with things like Mass Effect and Fallout and The Witcher. All those games are starting to incorporate things like that. Now, are they actually important to the gameplay? I don't know. We're going to find out today. We're going to talk about romance options. Are they important or are they just Kind of weird. Yeah, let's introduce our uh, continuum score. We're going to give everything that uh, scores a five a completely non-creepy and totally worthwhile kind of romance. A five. And then on the one side of the scale is going to be, well, a kind of just like creepy, over-the-top, and just gratuitous love moment. Is this... It is it done well? Is it not done well? Is it, it kind of weird? Does it serve the story? Is it just there for fan service? We're going to talk about that. And is it just kind of gross? I don't know if you want to call it gross. <laughs> we can call a it little, gross. A little weird. A little weird. A little creepy. Mm -hmm. So what games are we going to talk about? Uh, let's talk about Fallout 4. It's in the forefront of our minds because a Fallout game just came out, even though this one came out... <laughs> Like yeah, four yeah. years ago. Well, especially because um, I feel like Fallout Four gave more options than we could ever have imagined before, and uh, it also gave us options that um, kind of didn't really regard gender all that much. Um, depending on who you romance, there was a lot more options in general. There were yeah. there there were some options you you could go. Mm -hmm. um, you could go straight, you could go gay. There were all kinds of different options for it, and you were right. Now, not every character went both ways, though. There were some that were... Oh, no, totally, totally. ...specific, which, you know, that's that's a thing that happens. Mm -hmm. The cool part about those is that, um, well, having a companion in Fallout 4 was actually kind of important because there were a lot of times in the game where they were actually rather helpful, and uh, every one of the companions actually had a story element kind of built around them. Right, and they... Much like they did in previous Fallout games, they offered some kind of unique skill that helped out. Mm -hmm. it was kind of nice. Yeah. And so um, there was more to, like, trying to romance somebody other than just, you know, the satisfaction of them being your paramour. Who did you romance? I romanced Piper. 
Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. I, I, that was a very common one, I feel. Yeah, I feel like as well. I mean, I, I sort of accidentally fell into it, and I, I think I enjoyed it because um, one of her um, – the, the the skill that you got was actually kind of helpful. I kind of forget what it is right now. But once I got it, I was like, I kind of want to keep that, whatever it was. <laughs> I mm -hmm. romanced Curie. Uh, why? That's weird. Curie's a robot, sure, by the way. Sure, yeah. <laughs> can, we, can we get a picture of what she looks like when you first meet her? Yeah, right there. Because she's a Mr. Handy, Mr. Gutsy, whatever they're yeah, called. Yeah. Uh -huh. She's that model where it's just a sphere, an eye stock, and a jet. Yeah. And the fact that there was the option to romance her, mm -hmm. I had to find out what where it went. Mm -hmm. Because, like anybody else, it's a normal person or humanoid, but this was something different. <laughs> and I had to know, how was this going to play out? Mm -hmm. And in the end, I was disappointed. <laughs> Spoilers. Yeah. They give Curie a normal human body, and I'm just like, okay, great. It's just like every other one. There mm. was a chance for something really unique. Yeah. But I will say that Curie's one skill was extremely helpful. Mm -hmm. She would randomly just make stim packs. Oh, well, that's really helpful. She would randomly yeah. make a stim pack, and it would show up in your inventory. Mm -hmm. um, I will say one thing, though, that bothered the crap out of me about her thing was when you would find the USS Constitution hanging up <laughs> yeah, yeah. in one of the buildings. Of course. She would just go, look, it's the USS Constitution. Like, every time you turned and faced it, she just kept repeating it. <laughs> wow. Over and over I didn't over take again. Carrie with me anywhere, so, uh, yeah. I was trying to romance her. Yeah. Uh, but you had the opportunity to uh, go with Nick, Nick Valentine, and um, the cool part was you could actually kind of pick a paramour in that game that matched your play style as well, because certain paramours would actually, like, um, uh, feel more or less attracted to you if you um, acted in a certain way. And some of them actually preferred it when you did horrible things and stole from people and stuff like that. So you could find, you know, that perfect love in your life that support all of your horrible habits. So the question is, where does this fall on our scale? Because it sounds like the skills and everything kind of work with the gameplay mm -hmm. and the fact that they kind of uh, work, or they work with your karma system. Mm -hmm. But considering uh, the main reason you uh, wanted to attract, uh, you know, Curie. Uh, Curie was mainly just out of morbid curiosity, I suppose. Uh -huh. So I'm going to throw there. There's a little bit of creepiness to it, but not enough to throw it down the uh, the other end of the rabbit hole. I'm going to give it a four. Okay. I can go with that. Yeah. Fallout 4 is, you know, not too bad. No, not too bad. And also, a lot of those characters are really interesting. Yeah, yeah. And uh, the romance kind of side of it, honestly, kind of falls by the wayside for most of them. Mm -hmm. You don't even necessarily need to, like, fall in romantic love with any of them. You can just use them as your, you know, counter uh, your companion through most of the game. Right. And you do end up connecting with them. Oh, yeah. Like, I, I did connect with Curie and find found her character very interesting. Mm -hmm. um, let's talk about another one. Yeah. Let's talk about... Tell me one. Let's talk about Persona. Ooh, okay. Because yeah. you've played Persona. Absolutely. You've been playing Persona 5. Yes. Now, Persona 3, 4, 5 have really focused on an aspect of the gameplay being social links ah. or confidants or whatever you want to call them in any of the mm. games. And it's basically you making a connection with another character so that you can make more powerful personas. Right. And, and that's like the be all end all, like, you know, gamey part of the side of things. But in general, like the. Uh, um, the actual play portion of the game where you're actually learning about the world and, and advancing the story is all built around these social links. Mm -hmm. And it's a rather unique series, I think, in that way. Because it's it's focused on your relationships with other people rather than your relationships with other people just sort of kind of being tied the, into the overall story. You have to do the social link stuff in order to get, like, the full experience out of this game. Otherwise, you're mm -hmm. going to flounder. Yeah. Because as I said, your personas, which give you your power, aren't going to level up to the right level eh, mm. if you don't go out and interact with these people. Now, not all of them are romantic. No. But in every one of the games, there are romantic options. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about Persona 5. And Absolutely. Sp specifically, because that's the big one. That's the new one everybody's talking about. Mm -hmm. So... My thing with this, though, is unlike Fallout, where the, your decisions have an impact on how this person feels about you, you have to, like, make sure that you do certain things for them and whatnot, Persona 5 is pretty much, go hang out with them. Yeah. And uh, it's sometimes it's fun. Like, you know, even one of your kind of side characters, Yusuke, will be like, hey, let's hang out today. He's hey, got to he's gotta understand true art. Mm-hmm. Um, and that whole uh, kind of part of the game is actually a little bit fun. You get to learn a little bit more about them. You level up no matter what. And you learn abilities as you level up your social links with everybody. Right. Uh, we were talking about Yusuke, who can help make ability cards for you. And mm -hmm. you can then equip spells to your certain personas. But the thing is, is you do just hang out with them. Now, you answer some questions, mm -hmm. uh, which help you level up faster with that person or not. 
But otherwise, like, you can't really screw it up too bad other no. than just not hanging out with them. Mm -hmm. Now, as Lambo said, there are some really, really interesting abilities. But let's talk about the people we romanced in that game. Yes. So who did you romance? I romanced the doctor who uh, lives right up the street from the uh, LeBlanc Cafe. Why? Well, first of all, um, I did enjoy sort of this, like, the, first of all, it was nearby. And so it, you can actually go to her, like, in, on times when you maybe can't go to other places. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of helpful. Um, and uh, she actually does, as you level her up, you get um, more uh, powerful, like, healing items and stuff like that and access to things. And discounts. Yeah, and discounts on those kinds of things as well. Right. Mm -hmm. So uh, that and she's a very early confidant you yeah, get. Yeah, that you have access to. Right. Yeah. So I can, I can see that. She's also a very interesting character. Mm-hmm. So I, I always enjoyed her. Yes. Uh, I romanced uh, the the teacher. Had to. Mm -hmm. Had to know. <laughs> Again, when it comes to these things, like yeah, it's yeah. curiosity. That's what my driving force is. Like I want to see how this plays out. Uh -huh. I don't want to spoil too much about the game because mm -hmm. uh, the teacher is kind of a surprise when you get her as a confidant. Oh, yeah. But I will say the abilities you get from her are some of my favorites. And spoilers for this. And I told you this. Mm -hmm. Level up her social link as high as Yeah, I was going to say, now I'm, now I'm going to. So. Because in Persona, if you go into one of the dungeons throughout the day, you lose the ability to do anything else that day. Mm -hmm. If you level her up to max, she gives you the ability to not only go into a dungeon, but then do normal stuff that day. Mm -hmm. And that allows you then to increase social links with everybody else yeah. and get all that other stuff yeah, up there. Because the whole point of the game is to, you know, maximize your time, right. you know, and uh, be as efficient as possible. And I leveling her up actually would probably work pretty well. But they all do help out with the gameplay. Like, it's an important aspect of the gameplay. Yeah. Persona wouldn't be what it is without that. And I I'm actually going to say that for the most part, and most of it doesn't come off as too creepy. No. You know? No. Um, it, most of it actually has a story built into it, and it oh. is done ex almost ex exclusively for moving forward and leveling yourself up. Right. And I have to say, like, I finished the doctor story. I finished the teacher story. Both of those stories, very similar to each other in some regards, mm -hmm. very, very powerful, emotional, and you really get to know those characters. And all the social links in that game, whoever you romance or whoever you just befriend, there's a really great story in there and a lot of really interesting stuff. And it, it's worth your time to do. So where does this sit on our continuum? Is it creepy or is it useful? I, I've got to give it a five because, I mean, the game is built around social links and mm -hmm. confidence and getting to know people. And that goes for every uh, and, one of the newer personas. And romance games. is just a natural part of just, you know, growing up with other human beings and growing up. Because yeah. that's, that's what the uh, Persona series is about. It is. It Indeed. is. Indeed. So what's your next one? Um, the next one I was going to bring up was uh, Ge Gears of War. What? It really doesn't have a romancing option. Okay. But it does have an annoying relationship attached to it. Gears of War 2, specifically. Oh, no. <laughs> uh, the main character, uh, Dom, has his wife. Maria! <laughs> uh, who goes missing um, during the Locust Horde onslaught. And, uh, you know, the the worry is what's what happened to her. Is she going to be, like, turned? Is she going to be hurt and killed in some way? And it is a driving force for the main characters. It is. This is true. <laughs> Um, but does it come off as a as, a, as an interesting uh, story there? Now, and, uh, the, now the reason I bring this one up is because, like I said, it, it's not really like a romancing option. It's more built into the story. But this game is like pure one hundred percent, you know, manliness. I mean, you're fighting aliens as these jacked guys in basically like modified body armor to look like giant football players with automatic rifles with chainsaw bayonets. Yeah, and at some point. It rains glass, <laughs> or is it diamonds? I don't remember, but like, yeah, <laughs> I've got to be honest. Yeah, we played Gears of War one. We played Gears of War two all the way through, yeah. and I remember a lot of parts of that game. And I remember being like, "This is awesome," <laughs> but the one part of the game that I will always look back and be like, "Why mm -hmm. was was Dom's like wife's story? Like, was it kind of powerful? Like, it tried to be. It tried to be. It tried really hard." They really tried to kind of inject that little bit of humanity into the story, you know, just to avoid all the testosterone, I think, or, like, try to dig through it in some sort of way. But at the same time, this is a series <laughs> of games where you have an entire family of guys who just are made to die somewhere in that game. Like, literally, and they, they, they poke fun at it. Yeah. So I, I feel like it doesn't quite work in the series. Now, some no. people who might be really into the lore of Gears of War might disagree with us, but yeah. it I don't think it worked real well. No, it, it was didn't. not important to the gameplay because it wasn't the main character. It was Dom, uh -huh. who's there, yeah. but he's not the main character. Uh huh. I'm going to put this down at, like, a, 
a two. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to uh, definitely throw it kind of in that direction as well. It seems a tad gratuitous, so I'll also uh, stick on the two side with you there. That game is nothing but gratuitous, though. Mm-hmm. But it's not the kind of gratuity we want. No. Okay. All right. Mm-hmm. I'm going to talk about one you haven't played. Go for it. I'm going to talk about Fire Emblem Fates. Ooh, okay. Okay. So, um, now, the mechanic I'm going to talk about was in Fire Emblem Awakening. And, mm-hmm. and basically, it was this. When you're on the battlefield, any two units can be next to each other, support each other. Like, if one unit goes into attack, if there's a friendly unit next to them, they can join in on the attack. Okay. If they do this, their friendship meter goes up. Now, if it's a typically a male and female character, mm-hmm. you can get their ranks up to S. And by doing that, they have to fight in so many battles, see so many scenes. And in the scenes, you get a little bit of interaction between the two. It's always the same story. There's nothing else to do in there other than have them fight next to each other. If you get them up to rank S, they will marry. And they will produce a child. Oh, okay. And then that child becomes a unit. And the unit um, is typically the father's class with a mixture of skills from the two. Okay. Okay? So it's a great way to get new units. And it's a great way to take good units you've got and take the best of both parts and create something Amazing. Cool. Do you get to choose any of the uh, attributes after the skills? Or? Yeah. So uh, you have to equip so many skills, and you only get like so many slots. So you do get to pick and choose. Oh, okay, that's awesome. But when the yeah. child is born, it's pretty much just this, kind these of random are the skills. All right. Um, there is a little bit of a uh, time travel stuff going on there because it doesn't jump ahead for you to get that. But I'm not going to get into that. Yeah. Yeah. Go on. I ended up making an amazing unit in Fire Emblem Awakening by randomly having two people get married. But what I'd like to bring up is in Fire Emblem Fates, you have this. But in the Japanese version of the game, not only was there this aspect, but you can invite people, invite like people back to your uh, your house in your in your castle, like your abode, mm-hmm. and it would go into this first person view of them, and you could scroll up and down on their body, which you can still do in the English version. Creepy. But okay. in the Japanese version, go you on. can massage them. Oh no, that's. <laughs> that's that's gross. And sometimes that would help get your support up. Oh, to get them further along. Oh, really? and when you marry somebody, when the main character marries somebody, uh-huh. more stuff keeps happening if you keep inviting them back. The dialogue is also incredibly cheesy. <laughs> As we expect. And, uh, yeah. But here's... It's just uncomfortable. It is uncomfortable, and it's the Japanese... Are, you f- are, are they forcing you into it? <laughs> no, they don't force yeah. you into it, but as okay. I said, like... It's a great way to make new units with some amazing skills and some great customization. Like that one little weird, cr- and it's only the Japanese version. Only saying. the Japanese. Well, That's here's confusing. the deal: you can still go into the first person mode and like scroll up and down, like from here. But they took uh, out the massaging aspect of it. Oh yeah, yeah, you can't do any of that. That's weird. Actually, people were upset they took that out. <laughs> I'm just. I mean, I don't I'm really care. Weird it out. It, it's weird, but do you yeah. see like? No, no, totally. You, totally. Yeah, totally. and the support thing is, <laughs> as, as their support rank goes up, uh-huh. they'll do more damage as a support character. They'll defend you in battle. Sure. They'll increase your accuracy. Mm-hmm. Like, there's a, there's a reason to do it, and it makes the game better. Hmm. So the question is, <laughs> knowing that aspect of it, where does it lie? It definitely creeps it out a little bit. I know, right? Uh, I, I feel like there's enough good... But then that one creepy thing drags it down a couple. I'm going to throw it at a nice solid three. I would agree. Yeah. I would agree. Now, <laughs> the game's great. I love yeah. Fire Emblem Fates, Fire Emblem Awakening. Like, I love them all. But Fates, like that weird massaging aspect. I'm kind of glad they took out the North American one because yeah. it was just kind of weird. All right. And it was too much of a weird dating simulator experience. Mm. You've got one more, right? Yeah. Let's, uh, let's talk about the Bioware side of things. <sighs> oh, no. I knew this was going to happen. Yeah. Talking about games where you romance characters, it's the big ME, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Mass Effect. As creepy and as uncomfortable as it is, I'm talking about even being banned in Singapore. In Singapore! Is it because of the gratuitous scenes in one? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. The first one, at, at the end of romance options, the romance scenes were pretty... Icky. Gratuitous. Gratuitous is what I would call it. Now, um... The romance options in Mass Effect gave you the chance to get to know your characters, mm-hmm. um, most mostly your crew, your side characters, your party. Yeah. The um, two- there usually was a group of main characters, mostly party members, that you could, you know, first of all, you had to, you know, make friends with everybody. Right. The idea was, you know, you're interacting with a lot of them in between missions on the ships, and uh, decisions you make in the game affect a lot of those, uh, you know, relationships you have with them as well. Right, and um, particularly in Mass Effect 2, that mm-hmm. game was all about getting the crew together, gaining their trust, so that in the final mission, 
everybody survived. Yeah, and everybody had each other's backs as well. Right. Yeah. It was all about choices in that game. So I would argue that that game, like, it actually made sense to get to know everybody and kind of work with them. Did you have to romance anybody? No. As our good friend Mr. Snarls has proven time and time again, <laughs> yeah. no, because yeah. he never romanced anybody. In all, in a play, he, he played all three, all three, right? Uh, yeah, one, two, and three. And yeah, I don't think he ended rem- up not being able to. I remember he yelled at us because yeah. he was like, "I don't understand. Well, what well, am I doing?" Kind of like we said in the beginning, though, a good relationship demands a little bit of maintenance and work, mm. and uh, it does actually take a little, uh, just not not that much, but a little bit of effort to like make that extra time and say the right things in the right situations to be able to romance the characters. But the question is, mm-hmm. did it matter for the gameplay? Uh, no. No, it didn't. It didn't matter who you romanced. Um, it didn't change anything about the main gameplay mechanics, and it didn't really help anything. No. I mean, in two, you don't have to romance anybody. You just have to get their trust up to a certain level. Mm-hmm. But the romance was just there to kind of be an extra thing. Yep. It allowed you to connect with the characters, maybe learn a bit more. Um, for for example, I yep. romanced Tali. Yeah. And as the theme has been throughout this whole show, my entire reason for rom- romancing Tali was curiosity. Morbid curiosity. Because Tali is wearing a mask. You can't see her face. We never see Quarian faces. Mm-hmm. And I had to know what was under the mask. And this is under the mask. There you go. Spoilers. That was it. I mean, the game's how old now. Yeah, I know. But, yeah, like, it was very disappointing, much like it was with Curie. Mm-hmm. Um, that that's what I learned after three games. Now, you can only romance Tali in two and three. Yeah. The first game I romanced Liara. And I will say this. One thing did change about the game, and it gave me a unique experience that no one else I knew got. In Mass Effect 3, after romancing Liara in 1, Tali in 2, I took both of them on a mission. And dialogue popped up that specifically referenced the fact that I used to date Liara and was now dating Tali. Awkward. It was awkward, and I laughed the whole time because it was hilarious that this popped up. And no one else I knew had romanced Liara and then Tali and got that option. So it's like... This is unique for me. Mm -hmm. In a game where I would still argue that choices did matter in the experience, no matter what you may say about the endings, it was something unique to me. But did that go into the core gameplay mechanics and change really anything important? No, especially because all of my romance options were cheap flings that had nothing to do with anything. So where do we put this on the meter from one to five? (laughs) I think it's mostly just creepy, you know? Because uh, think about it, uh, the majority of the, uh, the the times that you know the, the rom- romancing seems like it's something people want. It's just for out of morbid curiosity. It's weird and awkward. So you know what? Are, are we gonna put it all the way down at one? I think it deserves a one. I think we have something at every in- in- into the spectrum. Yeah. Now it's pretty good. <laughs> let me say something after we give it a one. Yeah. As it was with that entire game series, it was fun to go to a friend and be like, what happened when you did this? Or what happened during this mission? Or what happened in this romance scene? Like, it was it was part of the experience, but you don't have to do it. Mm-hmm. And it doesn't really change anything about the gameplay. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. unfortunately, Mass Effect sits at a one. Yeah. And once again, at the risk of sounding like a bunch of lonely nerds without girlfriends. No waifu, no laifu. <laughs> uh, you know... It's strange. You know, it, it, it is really, really bizarre to just in general. Come on, you know. It's bizarre, but I got to say this because, it, mm-hmm. like, as somebody who's much more into the story of a game than you are, yeah. the idea to romance anybody or just have social links a la Persona or anything like that, I think really adds to the game. Mm-hmm. And it helps you connect with those characters more. Because while they may fall into a one like Mass Effect or a five up in Persona, no matter what, it gives you a little bit extra about the world and about the characters. Right. So, mm-hmm. I think it's thoroughly enjoyable. If not creepy. Creepy. Maskless Tolly. Not worth it. <laughs> but anyway. Yeah. <laughs> we have anything else to say about this? No. Not at all. <laughs> but, uh... No matter who it is you choose in whatever game to romance. Even the game of life. Even in the game of life. May you enjoy your Valentine's Day. May it be full of boundless love or just spending some time loving yourself. But for Nurse I'm Dr. Pants. I'm Lambo. Happy Valentine's Day, everybody.